Our scripture passage this morning is from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight, make his paths straight. Now John was wearing clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him, and all the region along Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourself, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from the stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit Good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff that he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Let us pray. Holy God, make us to know your ways. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Amen. Repent, you brood of vipers. Well, that's a fine Sunday hello to you, right? (laughs) Gotta love John the Baptist coming in to shake us up just a little bit this morning. I thought about wearing some camel hair and maybe a leather belt or whatever, but it turns out I don't own any camel hair. Shocking, right? (laughs) So here we are, the second Sunday in Advent, and we've begun our preparation for Christmas. Our tree has been put up and decorated. The greens, yeah, (laughs) thanks to the decorating committee, yes. The greens have been hung up, and it is beautiful and festive. And many of you have done the same thing in your homes, right? We start with the holiday cheer and the singing of the Christmas carols like we're going to do tonight at the Christmas potluck. We see all the holiday lights go up in the neighborhood, and we're buying presents and figuring all that out. And so then we come this Sunday morning to find John the Baptist kind of crashing our party and ruining our holiday cheer a bit. To name what Barbara Brown Taylor says, who's one of my favorite preachers, that John the Baptist on the second Sunday of Advent, all we want to do is come and come in and sing, O Holy Night, and instead we get John barking like a Doberman nipping at our heels, yelling about vipers, axes, and repentance. Each year, John the Baptist shows up this second Sunday of Advent and unsettles us a bit. He comes and he points to our trees and he forces us to ask the question, which tree and its fruits are we more concerned with? Which tree are we prioritizing? Is it this one? Is it this tree? And the one that has models in your own home, are we worried about the fruit that it's going to bear, the decorations, the lights, the fruits of the presence underneath? Or are we concerned about this tree? Are we concerned about what fruits we personally are going to bear in our lives? And if we're being honest, John's not always the welcomed holiday guest in our houses He's not the voice that we want to hear all the time, but John's voice is a necessary voice for us during Advent. 
And it's a voice that the church throughout the ages has continued to encourage us to hear in Advent. John's voice adds expectation and understanding to our Advent season. And it's the voice of John that calls us then to stop, to take a step back, and to think about what we're doing and how we're living, and ultimately to repent. Repentance is not a word that we often use around this time of year in our day-to-day living. And it's, you know, for John, we don't really use it in Advent very often unless it is John showing up. And in being honest, repentance isn't a word that we like to use often anyway. Repentance has a lot of other words associated with it, like sin. And to call people into repentance is to ask them to acknowledge that they've been sinful, that they're accountable for their actions, that they'll be judged, that they can't fix it solely by themselves. Those are a lot of words and ideas that we don't like to to think about, we tend to ignore, especially in our American culture. Starting at a very young age, we try to avoid all acknowledgement of wrongdoing on our part if we can get away with it. Think about where we try to blame our actions on somebody else. At least I did. Growing up, it was not my fault. It was my brother's fault, right? <laughs> when you're younger, you kind of push it off on your siblings and, or your friends or someone else. I didn't do this. They did it. When we do this, or at least when I did this, it was because I wanted to avoid punishment. I was trying to avoid judgment. But in those moments when we realize that we're responsible for something bad, then we try to fix it really fast and hope that no one will notice. And John's message today is that judgment is not something that we can avoid or push on to someone else or try to get out of it by fixing it really quickly. That we will have to stand before God And then that outcome is actually up to us. But John has some really good advice for us on that today. Repent. For John, there is no way that we could be in the season of preparation and waiting without also calling ourselves to repentance in God. How do you prepare for the Lord? How do you make straight the paths for him? It's through repentance. But what is repentance? It's easy to get confused and and think about repentance as punishment. I mean, that's kind of the system that we work on here in the United States or in, in most countries and even in our homes. If you do something bad and you get caught, then depending on the severity and what situation you're in, you could go to jail or end up grounded or in timeout or you lose a relationship over it. You might also have to deal with an angry boss, a spouse, a parent, or a friend. It's all about negative consequences usually. However, that's not what repentance means in John's mouth. Repentance in scripture is about change. In calling people to repent, John is calling people back to their covenant with God. And the change that John is calling for is total transformation. This is not just about feeling guilty or having remorse for doing something bad. This is not just about saying you're sorry or admitting when you've screwed up, though those are really important pieces of repentance and I don't want to jettison them. But repentance is bigger. It's about not only our outer change, but our inner change. To turn yourself away from what is evil, what is bad, and turn yourself to God, to what God desires. Repentance also involves the transformation of our our minds so that we better have an understanding of our identity as humans and our identity as children of God. So there's two things that I want to emphasize this morning that are outgrowths of repentance. And the first is discipleship. When we look at scripture this morning, we see that there's an expectation that comes with repentance. There's a responsibility When John is chastising the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the first thing that he tells them to do after calling them snakes is to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. There's a behavior requirement that is related to being repentant, and that is to act like it. There's a phrase that I ran across when I've been reading, and it says, talk is cheap, hypocrisy is real. 
And someone was definitely being John the Baptist when they wrote that phrase. When we repent and live a life of Christ, then our words and our actions have to line up. We need to show that our, our life has changed. And this isn't about works righteousness and, and just piling up good deeds to count for ourselves. But I'm thinking of the book of James when I'm saying this. James 1, says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's not about doing good things to be saved or doing good things to show repentance. It's saying that it would be absolutely crazy of me to walk away from a mirror and forget that I have blonde hair, right? It's saying that if we can hear the word of God and not change our ways and start following it, then that's crazy, and we must not really have heard the word of God. And it's just as crazy to think that we can repent, but have nothing change in our lives. Repentance is a requirement of discipleship, and those that repent will produce the fruit in their spiritual lives. They'll allow repentance to work to transform them. Anne Weems is a Christian poet, and she wrote one of my favorite Advent poems, and it's called In Search of Our Kneeling Places. And it speaks to the season of Advent and the decision that we each much, much make, each must make. And in part of the poem, she writes, in each heart lies a Bethlehem, an inn where we must ultimately answer whether there is room or not. When we are Bethlehem bound, we experience our own advent in his. When we are Bethlehem bound, we can no longer look the other way, conveniently not seeing the stars, not hearing the angel voices. We can no longer excuse ourselves by busily tending our sheep or our kingdoms. John the Baptist today is calling us to be Bethlehem bound and to make the choice that allows us to kneel in Bethlehem before God in repentance, to be transformed by the God of the universe. The outgrowth of this true repentance of allowing God to transform us is discipleship, to live lives that model the one that we kneel before, to live the way Christ lived, to love the way Christ loved. But there's another outgrowth of repentance that I wanted to emphasize this morning, and that is hope. In the Christian life, preparation is always something calling us to something bigger than ourselves. As repentance is a necessary step for preparation, it too is calling us to something bigger. It's calling us to hope. John is calling us to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. The ultimate hope that we have to live for as Christians, the day when the kingdom will be established and God will rule. Repentance provides hope because it allows us to become then part of that kingdom. In repentance, we turn towards God and join God in the work that he is doing to bring forth that kingdom. However, there is another related way that repentance brings hope. Earlier, I had said that repentance involves the transformation of our mind so that we have a better understanding of our identity, of who we are as humans and who we are in Christ. Repentance shows us the true character of humans that we're broken and sinful, that we overreach and we try to think that we can play God and make decisions all for ourselves. And this insight is not for us to be self-loathing about or to be hopeless in. No, this insight is for us to see how much God loves us and know that God has been faithful to generation to generation towards humanity. We see ourselves then through the eyes of a God who won't leave us where we're at, 
but wants us to transform us into being fully human, human in the way that God meant us to be, ones who are in relationship with and live like their creator. In the voyage of the Don Treader, one of C.S. Lewis's Narnia stories that are kind of beloved, there's a boy named Eustace. And he is Lucy and Edmund's cousin, and he's taken to Narnia during one of these adventures. And Eustace is selfish and kind of annoying and not a very lovable character in the beginning of the book. And in the book, they're on a boat with Prince Caspian, and they're off having this adventure, and they stop at an island. And once they get off this ship at the island, Eustace gets off the ship, and he kind of takes off for himself, and he finds some dragon's treasure on that island. And he immediately tries to take it for himself. And this act is an act of his living out his character, of taking it, of selfish, and it's betrayal. And it turns him into a dragon. There's the scene where Aslan transforms him back to a boy then later in the book. And Eustace has tried to shed this dragon skin, but he just couldn't. And so Aslan has to do it for him. And C.S. Lewis writes about this scene. The very first tear that he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just like I'd done it myself the other three times. Only they hadn't hurt, and there it was lying on the grass. Only ever so thicker and darker and knobbly looking than the others had been. Then he caught hold of me and threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After, it became perfectly delicious, and as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone. And then I saw why. I had turned into a boy again. Repentance is turning to God and letting God cut straight through the layers of our sin to our heart. We can't do it. Only God can, because like Eustace, we're afraid to go deep enough. But the hope that we can latch on to in repentance is that the more that we understand our brokenness and our sinfulness, the more we see the depths and the heights of God's love for us and willingness to transform us. To paraphrase Barbara Brown Taylor one more time, repentance is believing that God's goodness is greater than our badness. God is always bigger than us. And that true repentance isn't about us or about our limitations, our inabilities. It's about God. Repentance is about more, having more faith in God's power to make us new than in our power to mess up. So it's not guilt or shame or loathing and grief that are the true repent true companions of repentance, it's hope, it's gratitude. Through repentance, we become free in Christ, free to be who God ultimately created us to be, free to turn from despair, old habits, our sinfulness and brokenness, and turn to God in hope, who is there with a fresh new beginning for us. This is what this season of Advent is about. Hope, gratitude, preparing, waiting to experience the fullness and the completeness of God's love and forgiveness. As we are, like Anne Weems' poem says, Bethlehem bound. These next Sundays, I pray that each of us then can kneel before God and truly give him our hearts. As the classic Christmas hymns in the old little town of Bethlehem goes. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Amen. <laughs>